Hey everyone, want to do uh, end the day talking about cars? Who doesn't love cars? Uh, the thing is, there's a fair bit of stuff going on in the automotive business right now. Some people are very familiar to that. We live in Michigan. Uh, it's pretty near and dear to our heart. Uh, but we talk a lot in the industry about the future of mobility, which is just really a pretty pretentious way to say we're wondering what's going on with cars. Uh, the reality is, there is a seismic shift going on right now under our noses right here in the state of Michigan and around the world uh, that some people have some sense of, but I just want to spend a couple of minutes kind of bringing to you not only the implications to the industry, but really the implications to each of you individually as a member of society, because frankly, the changes that are happening and let me be clear, they are absolutely happening, and you're more than welcome uh, throughout this discussion and next year when you think back on it, go, that guy was crazy, he doesn't know anything. It's happening. You will see it happen in your lifetime. This isn't for your grandkids. We're dealing with a change that's unprecedented. Automotive typically moves pretty slowly. The last hundred years, we've kind of had a few things. We had an airbag. That was very exciting. We had an air conditioning. Power steering, for those of you who are old enough, remember when you didn't have power steering? In general, we just have a little incremental innovation. The last time we had a big deal, 120 years ago, we used to have horse and buggy. That's how we got around. Um, and then there was a transition from horse and buggy to having an internal combustion engine in the front of the car. That transition happened pretty quickly. If you look at the picture, the picture on the left, 1900, this is Macy's Parade in New York City, uh, you've got one car. For sure, there were people standing on the side of the road going, hey, what's that? That was kind of... I wonder if we'll ever see one of those ever again. 13 years later, same place, same part of the city, New York City, same parade, one horse. If you had been alive then, you would have seen this as just this really significant change. And then since 1913, eh, we've had small little incremental changes, but in general, we haven't done much. That level of change is coming right now to the automotive space. The name of this slide, Speed of Change, the Mary Barra story, I added that just uh, recently. Mary Barra, for those who don't know, you should know, living in the state of Michigan. But if you don't know, Mary Barra is the CEO of General Motors. Uh, you could argue whether she's a good CEO or a bad CEO. Again, you're more than welcome to uh, have an opinion on that topic. But she's been in the news lately. Whether you've read it or not, there's some General Motors plants that are closing, three plants that are closing. She's laying off significant parts of her technical staff. I mean, why is she doing that? They, GM must be in deep trouble, right? Because they must be losing a ton of money where she has to make these dramatic changes in order to right the ship. General Motors is coming off some of the most profitable years they have ever had as a company. They've made approximately $10 billion in profit each of the last two years. And she is firing 15% of her technical staff. A lot of friends of mine, frankly. I've worked with these people for a long time. People I love are getting let go. And is Mary Barra doing that because she doesn't like the people who work for her? Or she just wants to kind of flex her corporate muscles? No. Whether it ever shows up in a newspaper or a magazine or anything that you read online, the only real reason Mary Barra is doing what she's doing is because of this picture. The people who made the horse and carriage on the left picture. Trivia question, how many of those manufacturers became the manufacturers of the things on the picture on the right? It's a trick question, the answer is zero. What stopped people from saying, well, just get rid of the horse, put in an engine, I can still make what I'm making. What kept them from doing that? Inertia. You, you've got a business model that's going in one direction and you've got to make this right angle change. It is hard to survive disruptive change. Mary Barra is making this massive disruption to her own company today because she knows this level of disruption is coming her way. So what disruption are we talking about? This is an acronym that gets used in the business uh, quite a bit, CASE. Each of these individually are already happening. Connected, you connected to your car. If you own a reasonably new car, uh, you can have a Bluetooth connection to your car. The car is connected to other cars. Your car is connected to the infrastructure. There's connection between the uh, vehicles that are sharing the data. Autonomous, again, if you own a reasonably new car. You have lane departure capability, adaptive cruise control. You can take your hands off the wheel for like 10 seconds. Take a micro nap, I guess. Uh, but then you gotta grab the wheel again. 
Shared services, Uber, Lyft, being able to call a, a service and get the car, not my car, I'm just gonna borrow a car or borrow a ride. And then electric, Tesla being the most notable example, but all the automakers are flowing into kind of this space. Each of these individual technologies or concepts are kind of interesting. It's like, all right, that's kind of helpful, it's kind of neat. When you put the four of them together, it really starts to create a future reality that is dramatically different than the world that we live in today. So who's, who's winning? Who, who's on the forefront of all of this activity? Waymo kind of got started before anybody else. They got a bit of a jump start. Uh, and they're a pretty big company. Waymo is a division of Google, sorry, uh, for those who don't know that. Uh, it's part of the Alphabet company. They are way out in front relative to the technology of being able to bring an autonomous vehicle to market. This is the number of miles they drive without having a human intervene. They've now driven over two million miles autonomously, and the number of interventions is about three times better than the next closest person, which coincidentally is General Motors, by the way. Mary Barra is making that huge investment because of this graph. It has gotten her to the second bar. She's just behind Waymo in terms of the technology of being able to provide an autonomous ride. But then this list goes on, I'm showing, I think, 20 here, but it, it goes on. Everybody is trying to figure this thing out because the person who figures out the technology of how to provide the autonomous ride and provide that as a service is going to make an unbelievable amount of money. And this is where we start to lean into the, well, yeah, okay, there's a little Jetsons someday. Waymo announced, this is publicly available, this isn't any kind of special insider information. Waymo bought 80,000 cars last year. They are not, but I don't know, I haven't talked to John Krafstick, the CEO of Waymo, but I don't believe they bought 80,000 cars so that they could just park them in a warehouse. They bought them because they are going to put them on the street as soon as they can. And they're not quite there yet, which is why this thing is starting to roll out. Um, but it's not for my grandchildren. The cars are purchased today. General Motors is already building the autonomous uh, bolts. So in this case, there's no steering wheel. There is no gas pedal. There is no, there is no ability for you to control the car at all. It is going to drive you where it needs to drive you. Imagine again. Um, so the next slide is a really complicated graph uh, that kind of highlights the fact that there's a lot of people who get killed by cars every year. The, the next two or three slides here, we're just going to talk a little bit about what is driving some of this activity. This is under the heading of things that we accept as normal that just aren't normal. 35 to 40,000 people die in the US every year from automotive related accidents. That's 100 people a day, every day, every year, nonstop. And it's, well, you know, it happens, cars, accidents, a hundred people die every day and we're okay with that. It kind of makes me a little bit sick to my stomach to say those words. We have a plane that crashes and hundred people die and we say, oh my word, how could that ever have happened? But in my business, I am associated with killing a hundred people a day. Eh. And in America, we're like some of the safest people in the world. A little chart over here, if you can read it or not. Globally, we kill over a million people a year. That's unacceptable. And if you want to get to a point where you say, well, you know, what would be acceptable? How do I improve that? The answer to that question over the last years has been, well, let's just, you know, have better technology. Let's add airbags. Uh, let's add seat belts. We'll just have some of this technology that you talked about earlier about lane departure stuff. If you look at the blue line at the top, the total number of deaths, it really hasn't moved very much. The reality is that you people, and I include myself in the you people, every time we are given a safety feature, our behavior becomes that much riskier to say, well, you made it safer, so now I should be okay. If the car can drive itself for 10 seconds, I can quick send a text to my mother to tell her I'm okay. No, you can't. Don't text anybody, even if the car is driving for you. Um, the reality is we will never drive this down until we get the really bad drivers off the road. Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm with you. The only problem is, woo, we're all really bad drivers. You think that you're really good, but the data says you're not, and it hasn't changed. You're not going to get better until we take control away from you all and me. Um, people will continue to die, and that's not okay. Next one, urbanization. Uh, so again, the global chart looks almost exactly like this. Uh, you're basically in a situation where up until the Industrial Revolution, people all lived in rural environments. We're moving into, excuse me, we're moving into cities, uh, and cities are having to deal with uh, environmental concerns associated with that. Uh, having a gas-burning car in these big cities is a real problem, and actually moving people around is a bit of a problem. So you're already starting to see implementation of solutions to this problem. Oslo, Norway, whether you like Norway or not, Oslo, Norway, couldn't ban the car, because people really love their car, so they banned parking. <laughs> Genius. You, you can own it. How do, you can do whatever you want with it. You just can't park it. So enjoy the walk-in from the outside of the city to your home. But that is what's coming primarily in China and in Europe, but it'll come to the US as well, where we will say the only cars that are allowed in the city are connected, autonomous, shared electric vehicles. It will be driven by society, by cities needing to implement this in order to maintain this massive infusion of people through urbanization. And this is where it really starts to get crazy. Not my data, this is Boston Consulting Group. Today, when you take an Uber, it generally costs about $1.22 for that vehicle uh, to deliver that ride. If you go to an autonomous, connected, uh, shared electric vehicle, that cost comes down to 55 cents, where a mobility service provider could charge an extra 15 cents, charge 70 cents to you as a consumer. Um, you know, that's, a, that's a pretty good deal. That's almost a 40% discount. I kind of like that. Well, if I show the next slide here just briefly, um, there was a guy who wrote a book um, basically talking about the car you own today if I buy a car, put it in my garage, and I spend $30,000 on the car, which is about the average transaction price, that car is generating about $5,000 worth of value in data that you're giving away. It speaks to the, to the infrastructure and gives uh, traffic patterns. You talk to whether it's Waze or other things. The car is generating data, and you get no return. And his argument was, hey, if, if we actually got our return, we should get a discount check from all those people that are using our data. Uh, he's a former employee of Ford. That's kind of an interesting thought, but when you look at this model of connected autonomous shared electric, now I'm getting into somebody else's car and they're gonna actually take me from point A to point B. And again, Waymo, division of Google, I'm getting into a Google car. Would Google want to know who I am, all the things that I've purchased recently, when I got into the car, what I did in the car, what I listened to in the car, and when I arrive, and what's nearby of what I arrive, and I can actually send advertisements to you along that path and journey? Is that worth anything? Turns out people have estimated that to be worth about 60 cents a mile. Google can give you the ride for free and make money. I don't know that Google would give the car away free because I don't know that they have to, um, because they can then make additional money. But the only people who can make 60 cents per mile on you, if that's a, a legitimate number, I mean, that can be questioned and tested, is it going to be GM, Ford, and Chrysler who monetize that data? Or is it going to be Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google who monetize the data? And if it's the latter, which seems plausible, they will have a 60 cent per mile advantage over anybody else. So who's going to provide the ride for you when you go from point A to point B in the city? It's probably going to be a data company that does that. Which comes back then to the first screen that I showed. Imagine, if you will, again. Uh, the two pictures on the right, there you go. Um, let's come back to the disruption now. And again, Mary Barra, she's competing with Google to find a way to provide a ride for you from point A to point B in a connected autonomous shared electric vehicle where she can be competitive with the technology and the cost to deliver that ride. 
She's got a huge problem, and she's in second place. If you're Daimler and BMW and VW, Toyota, Honda, Nissan, and I can just keep naming them, they are scared to death that this is an existential crisis. They're not sure they're going to make it to the right side of this picture. And that's coming in the next 10 to 15 years. This is my last slide. Two years from now, you're going to go out for coffee with a buddy or a, a friend. And you're going to say, I remember that guy at TED. He said, it was a crazy thing. Cars going to be driving themselves. Boy, that guy, woo. Um, I seen one. I, I saw one somewhere in Detroit. There was a Waymo car, but it hasn't happened. I think Bill Gates is absolutely fantastically correct in describing disruptive change here because you won't see it in two years. You won't. You'll see one, you'll see two, and you'll just see this little evidence of it. And 10 years from now, and maybe it's 12 years from now, I, I don't have that great of a crystal ball, you'll look back and say, I think this is the way we always did it. <laughs> There's plenty of examples of this right there. I mean, you guys all have your iPhone. It's like, man, we've had iPhones forever. Or 10 years, I forget the exact date, 11. Um, when that day comes, you can then think about the crazy guy at TED and go, ah, I thought he was nuts. Hmm, turns out. Now, most of what I talked about has relevance to me, my, my business, the people I work with, all the automakers I work with, but it also has huge effect on you. The society of tomorrow will look very different. And the, the way that it looks is being decided by people running companies. And, and you, you have not been part of that conversation, most likely at all. And the reality is, if you want the future to look like what you want it to look like, you need to raise your voice. Because the decisions are being made right now for what society is going to look like 10 years from now. And for the most part, society is just kind of sitting on their hands. And this is what I want to leave you with, is that last sentence up there. Please, don't let yourself be lulled into inaction. And to be frank with you, I think it's really the expression that I would want to leave with you for the day. All of the people who presented today are talking to you about things that are happening that are significant. And if you think, oh, that's somebody else's problem, I I'm good, you can't ever let yourself be lulled into inaction. And that's what I'd like to leave you with. Thank you.